I'm delighted to have this opportunity to introduce our luncheon speaker, Dr. Dan McCauley from the University of British Columbia. A few days ago, buried in the back pages of an international newspaper, was a tiny entry which said that one of Asia's leading airlines would no longer transport shark fins. As you're all aware, probably anywhere between 40 and 80 million sharks a year are pulled out of the sea, their fins cut off and thrown back into the sea to drown. This is only one tiny illustration of a mounting problem in terms of the state of international fisheries. This ramifies upwards to the whole question of illegal, unregulated, unreported fish take, which accounts for billions of losses to uh, the federal states of the world. The general decline in the vitality of the oceans as a result of overfishing, climate change, acidification, will, I think, ramify upwards in terms of increased interstate tensions. So while so far we've looked at a variety of issues, whether it relates to hardware or maritime operations, piracy, and so forth, I think it's particularly informative and instructive for us now to turn to another element of the maritime realm, and that's to look at the state of global fisheries and what that means. We could not have a more informed and experienced commentator than Dr. Pauli, who's worked and studied in Germany, Philippines, Canada, published widely in Science, Nature, the New York Times, and so I'm delighted to turn the floor over to him to give a presentation on what I imagine will be the increasingly powerless state of international fisheries. Talk, oh, I was surprised to see so many military. I should have thought about it. Uh, I will have good news from the front. <coughs> we are winning the war against fish. <laughs> <laughs> they have tiny little brains. And <laughs> this is not surprising. Uh, I can start with an anecdote, and it will be the only uh, the three pictures you will see, three, four pictures, will be the only one that are not that were not created by my project. These, these are pictures that were done at a pier, at a specific pier in Florida in the 50s. And uh, a young woman who by now has, uh, is a professor has uh, unearthed this old image. This is the best catch that was obtained uh, from Key West from a certain pier with a certain boat, a day boat, where you go. That was in the, in the 50s. And then the same pier, <coughs> This is the best catch, the best, the biggest fish that we caught in the 80s, in the same pier, the same distance from the place. And this is in 207. And this, this is summarized in one graph. Um, you may, you may laugh, you may smile. Uh, this is uh, one of the few discoveries that give rise to a cartoon. Um, but uh, we can look at this more scientifically. So, in a sea, we eat more than just grass, that is uh, corn and wheat and, and, and grain uh, in general. Uh, we eat more than that and the, he the herbivores, cows and sheep and stuff. We eat, the grass is uh, called phytoplankton, it's very tiny, we cannot eat it. Zooplankton, the cows, the gazelles, are also tiny, we don't eat them. We eat fish that are sardine and showbies that eat the zooplankton, or we eat uh, the top predators, which are uh, trophic level four. This is the only piece of jargon that I will introduce, contrary to your many acronyms that I've heard this morning. And uh, the, the, this trophic level tells you where you are in the food web. And every fish, tends to have a certain food trophic level. You can imagine a shark cannot eat zooplankton, 
and uh, 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 herring cannot eat uh, other top predators. Uh, top predators. So uh, a fish has a certain trophic level, and if you take the catch statistics of a country, you can uh, you can express it in terms of the phytoplankton production by going down the food web. Oh, I forgot to say that between uh, the production at each level, you, there is about 90% loss. 90% loss of efficiency, and then that is uh, the transfer efficiency between trophic level is about 10%. <coughs> so, in a, while there was fisheries in the world, uh, in all the world, uh, artisanal fisheries, industrial fisheries, that is intense, intense industrial fisheries that burn fossil fuel, existed only in Northern Europe and in the place that are in red, uh, in the 50s. Then um, they used up to 30% and more of the primary production that was occurring in these waters. So you have the primary production, uh, the production of algae is very variable between places. Generally in the ocean, in the central ocean, it will be 100 times and 1,000 times less than in the coast. But you normalize the whole thing by saying how much of the primary production of what is there is used by fisheries. And 30% is a lot uh, for orientation. In on, on international system, we use about 40% of the world's primary production. We use, so 30% is a lot. And it was concentrated uh, in, a, in a, the areas of Omris in Europe, North America. And now the, the, the primary production that we need, that we require, is uh, that much. Uh, all over the world. And the transition is very interesting. The transition, whatever threshold you consider strong exploitation, 10%, 20%, or 30% of primary production observed, is increased at the rate of about 1 million square kilometers a year. So every year, from the 50s to the 80s, about 1 million square kilometers, the fisheries expanded, they reach by one million square kilometers per year. Now, if I were, if you were my student, I would ask you, what happened in the 80s? In the 80s, what happened is UNCLOS, the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, that closed the EZ to distant water fleet. For example, the US was exploited, the, the waters of the US, by Japan, by fleet from Europe, and so on, not feasible. So the distant water fleet of uh, of a distant water fishing nation had to expand into the high sea, uh, and therefore they they had to expand it, and that was the, the the increase in the 80s. And now the fisheries uh, don't really expand anymore because there is not much to expand to. And this expansion, if you in blue the little shapes in blue on the right are the areas that were of increase that uh, in each decade. And you can see they have a centroid, and this centroid uh, is more south southward. And uh, basically, it means that uh, the, the, the center of gravity of fisheries has actually moved south uh, from, the, from around Western Europe to Africa. And now we can predict, this is about a point uh, 8 degrees uh, uh, latitude per year, we can predict when we are all going to fish uh, krill in the Antarctica and nothing else. And it has become, we, we, there are industrial fisheries on the Antarctic shelf and the Antarctic slope. So th that is happening right now, this, this uh, southernization. At the same time, the fisheries are moving rapidly uh, in depth. That is, they are operating deeper and deeper. Um, this is common for uh, very big trawlers, which correspond to the size of, I guess, a normal frigate or a little, certainly bigger than a destroyer, to, uh, to fish uh, at 1,000, uh, 1,500 meters. So the fishing effort and its uh, uh, and related uh, fuel consumption is actually spread throughout, throughout the world and uh, this has a massive effect. This is based on 
a thesis of a student from Quebec that I had, and uh, uh, the effect which we assessed for every little cells of uh, every little cells of half degree, we have about 180,000 such cells, is that uh, the decline of biomass, the biomass that was removed by fisheries, is for the total for the world ocean about 13 percent. So there is 13 percent less fish. If you look only at the predator, uh, predator has been defined at trophic level 3.5, you remember the pyramid, 2.5 and up, the decline is about 45, 44%. If we look at, at uh, the decline in, inside the EZ of countries, the decline is about 60%. So predators have, are, are going. And in the high seas, there are more predators there left. For example, tuna. In the in EZ, the predators are things like cod, and we know that the cod, for example, is doing very badly. And if we look specifically at the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, the decline is 80% of the large predators. The, the Indian Ocean, the South Atlantic and South Pacific, are on their way down, and Antarctica is all over. So this is another way of looking at this. And uh, you, the same map, the decline of predators, they were already reduced in the 50s, and uh, now uh, the, this entire area is uh, almost free of predatory fish. Almost free, they are declined by uh, 90, 95%, and sometimes 99%, and 99.9%. The cod uh, in Canada is a case in point, because some sharks have been exploited. You can dive in certain area, there is no fish. In the Mediterranean, for example, if you, if you go scuba diving in Turkey, there is no fish to see. And another way to express this is that the, the mean trophic level of the catch is declining. This is a, a bizarre thing, but imagine we fish an ensemble, we fish all the fish that are occurring on a shelf. Uh, uh, with trawlers, for example. We catch big fish and large and small fish. The big fish need longer to mature and to reproduce. They are the first to 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 fail under under strong fishing pressure, and so they will decline more rapidly than the small fish. And in fact, the absence of big fish will release uh, there is uh, will will be uh, for the advantage of the very small fish because they will not be consumed. So at first, the small fish are doing fine, and then we concentrate on them also. And you can see that in the composition of the catch. The composition of the catch at the beginning is, is lots of large fish, and then the trophic level, the average trophic level of the catch is very high. And then at the end, the average trophic level of the catch is low. This is called fishing the online food web. And I have coined this term in 98, and people use it all over the place now, because uh, you can see this phenomenon everywhere. Uh, it looks like this. You, you have a, a fishery that began, it exploded the big fish, and then it, it, it uh, <coughs> finds itself at the end of the, of the arrow here. Also, trawling, uh, trawling that is dagging a <coughs> net behind the boat has the effect of laminating the ground. So the animals there, these are not flowers, gentlemen. These are, these are, these are animals that uh, eat plankton that falls uh, on the ground, marine snow that falls on the ground, and these things go. So at the end, you have a muddy bottom. A muddy bottom with no animals that can eat the marine snow. And so you find yourself accelerating the processes of, uh, of uh, the creation of dead zone. Dead zone, you are you find in newspapers, people say, oh, they, that's because uh, fertilizer come down, for example, Mississippi. But it's also because there is nothing on, on the bottom to consume the excess algae. And so the, the fertilization from the Mississippi in this case, and uh, the, the fishing of the, the trolling go hand in hand in generated conditions that lead to dead zones. And dead zones, uh, are good for jellyfish. And I will talk about jellyfish because you will encounter them from, if you look down from the ship, more and more. 
Um, uh, obviously, coastal development are also encouraging the growth of jellyfish because they have uh, life stages that uh, are so-called polyps that uh, that uh, they need a little surface to attach themselves. Um, then they have a, a stage in their life that is the larvae, and if we fish the small fish, oh, we don't. Uh, this is the food of, for the larvae, they are doing fine. So, trawling and dredging is also uh, creating conditions where they have no, no competitors and predators because, uh, again, if they were poly on the ground, uh, there is, uh, uh, they, would, they would not have competition because the competition from crabs and uh, other things is all dead. Incidentally, it's a picture from space, and you can see, uh, we can tell from, uh, uh, from space uh, what a boat does. Uh, and we can even see uh, whether or not that boat is discarding uh, the, the fish that we catch, the so-called bycatch, because uh, at be better resolution than that, you can see individual gulls that are feeding behind the boat. <coughs> so we have a, a student of mine has done an assessment, uh, jellyfish increase every Jellyfish increase everywhere, and that is not good. For example, the Japanese fisheries, coastal fisheries, are uh, suffering from an invasion uh, of uh, giant uh, jellyfish that come. Uh, the Chinese colleagues don't want to admit this, but they come from China. And uh, one of these days, they will establish themselves in Japan. But it's bad enough that they, they cross the strait between China and Japan, and they end up coming on the net. And they cost billion dollars in, uh, uh, in destruction. And uh, this is also the case with the, the intake of uh, the intake of uh, power plants and I don't know about vessels, but uh, they are uh, bad news. And the, the only thing that you can uh, you can uh, positive you you can actually uh, eat some of them, uh, but only some species. Um, uh, meanwhile, uh, things are heating up. Uh, when, when I prepared that slide uh, about uh, several years ago, um, I assumed that we would go on to the, uh, the, on to the, the more reasonable profile, uh, that we would reduce our emission sharply. But actually, the worst case scenario is what we are on. So uh, I can continue. Um, you know, as you know, fish are cold-blooded. What it means is that they take the temperature of the environment, and uh, they uh, they are they have each species at a preferred temperature. And if this temperature moves, uh, if the water masses move, or rather, if the temperature uh, moves, they have to follow. And this uh, this uh, this movements have occurred, and they. The, uh, for example, in the North Sea, we, uh, it can be quantified quite exactly. This is about 40, 50 kilometers per decade uh, that the fish move uh, on the average uh, due to temperature changes. And uh, we can obviously imitate this. Uh, we, we can simulate this, I mean. Um, we take uh, every fish that we, uh, that we study, Every fish that occurs in catch statistics has a typical distribution map. That's, for example, the map for a little uh, uh, fish in, uh, of China, of the Chinese coast. And this fish we selected because uh, I had a postdoc at the time, and he's Chinese, and he liked this fish. So um, this fish occurs in northern Taiwan. You can see it doesn't occur in Japan. It doesn't occur off North Korea, and it doesn't occur in the high sea. Um, and because of the way it occurs, its temperature profile can be inferred, right? We, we know that uh, it, this fish likes 15 degree plus minus 5 degree about. And, uh, and if the temperature changes, it has to move. So basically, we, we constructed little models that in each cell, there is a population that uh, sends uh, larvae out. And if they encounter a good temperature the next year, 
they will blossom, and if they uh, at temperature encounter a bad temperature, they will not not do well. And uh, then we get from our colleagues in Princeton the uh, simulation uh, of the temperature in the next decade, and this is my attempt at an Oscar. An Oscar, uh, uh, I probably will not get one, but uh, this is the only film I have ever done. Um, and you can see the fish uh, moving, I may mean, like, uh, in this case, north. And uh, for 30 years, it is now in the Bohai Sea, it is North Korea, it's not anymore in uh, Taiwan. Now this, imagine this, repeated with all the fish that we know, uh, that occurs in status, uh, that we know the distribution of, that occur in, in fishery statistics. What we get is, uh, well, it's another example. Uh, there are some fish that uh, the distribution simply disappear because this fish is linked with ice that uh, is going to disappear. Shell, uh, shell ice. Anyway, uh, what we see here is uh, the result of a, a simulation that involves over a thousand fish like, that move, like the one that I've shown you. And what you see is that the Antarctic, uh, Arctic will be invaded by, uh, by fish like cod because they, like, they will lack it there. The Arctic species will go down the tube. The Antarctic species will also go down the tube. But what is most dangerous is the local extinction in the, in, uh, in the tropical band. You see that? Because each of these fish carries, so to say, on its back a potential catch. And this potential catch can be estimated. I will not bother you how. But the point is that, that this potential catch then is, can, will be reduced because in the tropics, you don't have the fish. They, they move away from the tropic, but they are not replaced by anything. Whereas of Canada, you can say, oh, we're going to have, uh, we are going to have a replacement. And it is beginning to happen. We are, for example, the, 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 the salmon are not doing very well. Uh, and in fact, the, the Pacific salmon are not uh, in a, that occurred in California are doing very badly. The fisheries are being closed. Here in, in BC, this is uh, intermediate level, uh, though they have already have problems getting into the Fraser River at time because it's too warm for them. And in Alaska, they are still doing all right. But on the other hand, we get we get uh, Mexican jumbo squid. Uh, you might not know that, but we do have in BC uh, Mexican jumbo squid. And if, to the extent that people uh, learn to fish them, uh, this would be a translation, right? Uh, in England, for example, the fish uh, species that occurred of Spain and North Africa. This is now uh, what has happened. But you can see that uh, in, uh, in the tropics that cannot happen. And what we get here is the same situation that we get for agriculture. And if you want, no, I want it, but if you want a crisis, there is a crisis. Because uh, the, all these countries will depend on fish to a large extent. I have lived a long time in the Philippines and Indonesia, and you can see how they, they're going to be affected. And this is similar for rice, incidentally. Uh, rice is at the edge of its temperature tolerance. And uh, this map corresponds exactly to what you get uh, if you look at agriculture, for the, basically the same reason. And uh, here we, we have expressed this map simply uh, as a function of latitude. And you can see that some country will be winning. Norway will be doing fine. They always win at everything. This is amazing. <laughs> and, uh, at least for four well. And uh, the countries of the tropics will will see uh, uh, a big problem. But the, the what is tragic about it is that we never going to know this is due to global warming. Because at the same time, there is uh, the research is not being done because there are not many researchers. Data are not available. So. This is, we're never going to know for sure. This is due to global warming and this is due to local condition of overfishing or whatever. It's going to be not, it's not going to be so popular. 
Uh, this is another, another version of it. I should also add that this representation is two, year, two years old, if I'm not mistaken, three years old. So the, 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 the axis will shift because lots of, uh, uh, of factors were not considered. For example, we did not consider the oxygen level that they will encounter at the place where they come. And in fact, there is, uh, for some of you have, who have read the international press, one of our paper has hit the press uh, two days ago, uh, the, sh the fish will shrink in addition because they will not have oxygen. This is all over the press this last day, and it is our paper. Um, another challenge is that we don't have, uh, I heard this morning, the, uh, the, the challenge with the information. We don't have we don't have good statistics, and it is actually lousy. Um, uh, all countries in the world uh, send their data to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. And when you ask people what, what is happening with fisheries in the world, the fishery statistics of the UN is, is what is happening. Uh, everybody uses the statistics of the UN. And here are three examples of the UN fishery statistics. Um, Mozambique uh, catches uh, that amount of fish, but it reports that this is only uh, uh, industrial fish that they report. The stuff that they export, the stuff that they eat themselves is not reported. So you have the absurd situation that Mozambique has a lower, which has a, no, a very long coastline, has a lower, much lower, according to the FAO, uh, much lower uh, consumption of fish per capita than uh, the average for Africa. This is nonsense, and this is only because uh, of this bad reporting. This has, doesn't also, uh, this affect also uh, developed countries, uh, American Samoa <coughs> connected with the US would expect that it is uh, better, and you have that situation. Colombia is my other example. We did this study with, uh, together with uh, a Colombian colleague who, had, uh, who was a friend with him, with the Minister of Fisheries, and so we got lots of catch uh, data that were accurate, and we found that uh, Colombia had a catch about two times as big as uh, over the whole time as uh, it reports. And we found this uh, to be everywhere the case. So what we find is uh, uh, instead of a catch that is uh, about 90 million tons and stable, what FAO tells us, we find that the catch of the world <coughs> is probably 140 million tons, but it's not stable. It's uh, rapidly coming down. And the, the reason why we don't see that is because there is a huge amount of illegal catch, unreported catch, and uh, that is the problem of our time. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem because uh, just as one can track uh, uh, enemies, one can also track uh, uh, pirates and uh, with satellite, and uh, the, many NGOs, uh, that is non-government organizations, are now seeing the point that, because government don't want to share the, the results of the observation of the satellite with civil society. Uh, military satellites, which are very precise, are not used to monitor fisheries statistics, uh, fisheries operation, and so, we find that the, it would be necessary for civil society to have its own satellite. I, I guess that's what it, what it amounts to. And uh, we, we will have to uh, uh, create a parallel system to find out what uh, really happens in terms of catches. And uh, here, the catch in color is that reported, and the discard and the other EIU are not reported, and uh, next year uh, this will be reported, and it will be a big stink in that. Even uh, will be uh, you will be uh, finding out about. It. And that's all. This brief, and I don't mind answering specific questions. Thank you very much.